Okay. Um, welcome everybody to this uh, session about uh, pre-registration in the social sciences. Um, I'm the moderator of the session and I'll start out with a short introduction about pre-registration, about the concept of pre-registration. Um, I also try to coordinate the Q&As after each talk and I will end up with some uh, closing remarks. Um, but first, um, what is pre-registration? So uh, pre-registration is basically that you specify your research design, your hypotheses uh, and your analysis plan before you're actually uh, looking at the data of your study. Um, and you see on the right here, on the right figure, that it's, it's gaining popularity a lot. So in 2012, uh, we had 38 pre-registrations on the Open Science Framework. And uh, Brian Nozak uh, actually expects that uh, at the end of this year, we would have 85,000 registrations logged on uh, the Open Science Framework. So um, it's really gaining popularity, um, which begs the question, why do so many people uh, pre-register their study? Well, as you're probably aware, we're currently facing this replication crisis, where a lot of results uh, do not uh, replicate. And uh, a common belief is that this is partly because researchers, um, they tend to desire a specific result. Usually this is a statistically significant result, a p-value below 0.05. Um, and the problem with this is that researchers during their studies and during their statistical analyses, they either consciously or subconsciously steer their, their results in that direction. So for example, in the data analysis, they uh, omit certain variables or certain values uh, to get this uh, to this big p-value of uh, lower than 0.05. This is a practice called p-hacking. Now, how can pre-registration help with this? Uh, in a pre-registration, you set out the rules in advance. So you basically, all your decisions, you already make clear from the beginning. So there's no room to make these data contingent decisions later on in the process. So that way your hands are tied, so to say, and p-hacking uh, is not really an option anymore. So this way, uh, pre-registration can help um, uh, solve the replication crisis, so to say. That's the theory, at least. So how is pre-registration? So is it actually doing what it's supposed to do? Uh, we're not sure. So there is some evidence from uh, medical sciences because they uh, already have mandatory registration of clinical trials for over 20 years. Uh, on clinical trials of GOF, which you see on the left side. On the right side, there is a systematic review by Ruby Thibault uh, and others. And they find that uh, in a lot of clinical trials, the registration does not match with um, what they actually do in their studies. So there is selective reporting, both of interventions, analyses, and outcomes. Um, so how is that in the social sciences? Well, that is the topic of this session. And here are our four talks. So we will start with uh, Marcel van Asse. He will talk about the quality of hypotheses in psychology pre-registrations. Then I will take the helm. Uh, I will talk about the effectiveness of pre-registration in psychology. Uh, then George Ofosu will talk about effectiveness of pre-registration in economics and political science. So we uh, capture several of the social sciences. And finally, Sarah Ann will close uh, with a talk on pre-registration and trust in science. So first, uh, I'd like to introduce Marcel van Assen for the first talk. Um, Marcel has a background in uh, mathematical psychology and is currently a professor in mathematical sociology at the Utrecht University, which is in the Netherlands. Uh, but he spends actually most of his time at Tilburg University. Uh, he's just appointed vice dean in education. And most importantly, he is my PhD supervisor. Um, so I'm really happy to uh, announce him to you. So Marcel, uh, take it away, please. Yeah, thank you, uh, Olmo. And starting up here. Yeah, can you see my presentation? Okay, thank you. So my talk is on the quality of hypotheses in pre-registrations. Um, Olmo and I, we led this research. We are both from the Meta Research Center. 
and uh, five first year psychology students did this uh, research with us. And Maxim Sidnikov is a research master student. Okay, so what do I mean with a quality of hypotheses? Well, what I mean is the structure and formulation of hypotheses, not the content. We do not evaluate the content. And how can we, we, we uh, loosely speak about the quality of hypotheses? Well, loosely speaking, it is, if you see an hypothesis, can you link it to one specific test, if you have a data to test this hypothesis. So that's loosely the definition. And here, an hypothesis which uh, is not really satisfying this. Uh, if we read this, while some, fact, some other factors may emerge as predictors, for example, job satisfaction, we generally expect these effects to be weaker than the uh, effects of moral uh, concerns. So just a moment. I, the presentation has gone. Don't see the presentation anymore. This is annoying. Now I see the presentation. So you, you may wonder, okay, but this, uh, this is no uh, hypothesis. Well, I would agree with you, but many hypotheses that we find in pre-registrations are uh, like this. So what is the context of this project? I'm, I'm talking about the quality of hypotheses in pre-registrations. Well, this is embedded in a huge pre-registration project by Olmo. So this is just a tiny piece of it. And as I said before, it is part of a research project for with five first year psychology students. And although this is not the topic of this presentation, I highly recommend to do projects with a few first year students. It's really uh, giving energy and it's much more fun than giving lectures to 300 psychology students. Okay, so uh, what is the main message? Yeah, I often start off with the main message because uh, some people may uh, drift off. And then it's most important that you um, know what the main message was. Now I have three main messages. And the first one is that um, pre-registration is really important. And I think the most powerful method for safeguarding the quality of conformatory empirical research in theory. That is that I think, I believe strongly that in a number of years, it can be 10 or 50, pre-registration will be the standard in the social sciences as it is in uh, medicine. Now, okay, so uh, pre-registration is very important. Remember this because the remainder of the talk will show some problems with pre-registrations. That is actually the second message here that pre-registration in psychology does not yet safeguard quality of research. It's not yet effective because if we look at the hypotheses of these pre-registrations, then uh, only 40% of these hypotheses was good, 
the other 60% was not. And if you look at the pre-registration level, only 80.6% of pre-registrations was good. That is in 82% almost pre-registrations, there was at least one hypothesis that was not making the most sense. And the conclusion I draw, I personally draw from this, is that most research in psychology that pre-register pre do not take pre-registration seriously and or do not fully understand pre-registration. This is a very harsh conclusion, but um, I hope that after uh, you see the data, you tend to agree as well. And then finally, the uh, main message is that because pre-registration is so important, we should do it more often, but at the same time, we also should do it better. Now, I have no fancy colors or gadgets in my presentation, so I have to do it now. These three main messages can be summarized in, yes, pre-registration, yeah, we should do it. And then second, oh no. And then third, come on. Come on, we should and can do it. Okay, let's continue then with the uh, content. The value of pre-registration. Well, um, one of the main messages was that the pre-registration is very important um, in uh, empirical research. I tried to explain this, but I, I realized that this is very hard. We, Take, uh, you have to take much more time for it. So I will very briefly summarize why it is important. It goes like this. First of all, empirical papers contain p-values. And uh, you could also tell this story with, with, with other statistics, confidence intervals, Bayesian uh, base factors, it doesn't matter. One statistical uh, piece of evidence, say p-values and decisions depend on it. And uh, what we learned from our statistics classes is that how these p-values work is that we have a population, sample, test, done. That, and then p-values work perfectly. And we can interpret p-values um, as huh? alpha 0.05, then a p-value of 0.05 uh, uh, is rejection or smaller. And uh, when it's higher, we don't. And these p-values then represent the probability that you uh, get these data more extreme than the lowest. So that's the interpretation of a p-value. Now the problem is that when we have not such a simple process as we were taught in our statistics books, but data-driven decision during the process, then properties of p-values are destroyed. That is, um, it's no longer the case that the probability that you reject a hypothesis, null hypothesis, is five is is five percent. P values uh, and their properties no longer work, and uh, these data driven decisions are known. Yeah, um, almost called them called them p hacking, but I like more research degrees of freedom and the garden of forking paths. Now, because of these data driven decisions, p values no longer have their properties. And decisions based on them are therefore, um, yeah, can be questions in many papers. Now, where does pre-registration come in? In pre-registration, we specify one path, how the research will go. And in that way, the properties of p-value can be preserved. Now, in um, our paper in 2016 of the Meta Research Group, we explain how you could try to avoid this uh, questionable research practices or, or the research degrees of freedom to get only one path. And what I will talk about today is the start of the path or a phase in the beginning of the, of the path that is the hypothesis. We can only guarantee that we have one path in confirmatory research when the hypothesis is well specified. The hypothesis is not well specified, we already run into problems. And so that's the significance of this project I am going to talk about. Now what, how do we define a good hypothesis? Well, we uh, defined or, or thought of 
five criteria that a good hypothesis should satisfy. A good hypothesis is a hypothesis that satisfies all these five criteria. The first one is that the hypothesis should contain at least one variable, mostly two or more, but at least one. So if you have a hypothesis, we predict an effect, this is not a good hypothesis. Well, um, I decided to give not too many examples because yeah, we have in the end more than 450 hypotheses. It would not be representative anyway. So I stick more to the, to the theory, but I, I will give some examples. The second and most difficult criterion is that a hypothesis should be understandable. And I will explain in more detail how we, uh, how we uh, operationalize this. I think in a nice way. Um, it's not, you cannot really operationalize this um, or define this in words. We tried this many times, it didn't work. So I will come back to this, but um, intuitively it means that it has to have one unambiguous interpretation. So um, reading this hypothesis here, we predict that this group will demonstrate other behavior indicative of altruism. Uh, well, we, we at least as a group, we didn't know really uh, how to interpret this unambiguous. Third, and um, maybe not the most difficult one, but a very important one, it turns out, a hypothesis has to be single. That means it cannot be translated into multiple different hypotheses. A general structure where you have this, uh, this criterion violated is the following, A and B have an effect on Y. It's not a single hypothesis because this can be translated into A and B together have to have, should have an effect or A alone and B alone both should have an effect or maybe A should have an effect and B not. And, and so it's, it's not clear how this actually translates. And I have here some examples that we found where we have this structure. For example, I will only read out the first one Partisans would experience more stress and less well-being during the election campaign. And um, here too, more stress, less well-being. We have an, uh, com yeah, a, a double hypothesis. Now then, uh, direction. I think this is clear. And the hypothesis should at least say something about the direction, and not as as here that uh, it's not clear what is meant. And this is always true here. And five, we have uh, falsifiability. Going to the data collection, um, it is part of the project of Olmo, which has more data than this. So this, this research is halfway. We have 140 pre-registrations of seven pre-registration types, mostly the pre-registration challenge and uh, um, the other uh, type. And uh, in total, we have uh, more than 400 hypotheses. 454, I believe. Then the uh, protocol. The protocol we aimed for reproducibility, attempting to eliminate subjectivity. And that was really hard. We had to revise the protocol um, almost 10 times to, to get a protocol that, that worked relatively well. It had two stages. First, we take the pre registration and we identify the potential hypotheses. This is done by two coders simultaneously. They read the pre-registration and they do, uh, they search for hypothesis section. If they find it, they uh, copy the hypotheses where the restriction is that it should be one sentence. And if there is no separate hypothesis section, then uh, they copy sentences from the pre-registration that has these keywords over here, expect hypothesis, investigate, predict, and replicate. And then after the coding, there is a reconciliation phase where um, first sentences are eliminated that have nothing to do with hypotheses, but that still contain these words. Then they determine the hypotheses. In 80% of the times the coders agreed um, immediately, then they discuss, and if then they don't agree, two third coders, which were Olmo and me, we also take a look at it and take the final decision. 
And in the second, we score the potential hypotheses. And this means that two coders each score the hypotheses on these four first variables. So that this does it contain at least one variable, understandable, single, and direction. And then in the reconciliation stage, uh, we have a similar structure. And I tell you already here that 68% the coders had the same scoring. And uh, after the discussion, it was more. And in 12%, the third coders had to make the final decision. About understandable, I said this was the most difficult one. What we did is this, each coder had to classify the hypothesis. Was it a hypothesis about an association, moderation, et cetera, A to G. And F at the lower bottom is here, cannot be categorized. So you read the hypothesis and you have no clue what it is doing. And uh, what we do then is if both coders disagree about the, uh, the categorization of the hypothesis, or if it contains F for both, then we decide it is not understandable. And we come now to the results and I immediately uh, come up with the discussion because there are not so many results in this rather qualitative uh, research project. The first important conclusion is that it is very hard to identify and locate hypotheses in often badly organized pre-registrations. For instance, lists of hypotheses are often not used or not used effectively. And uh, if we look at scientific papers, so not the pre-registrations, but the papers, there too, we hardly ever see lists of hypotheses. But if we look at student theses, one of our uh, group uh, examined student theses, Augustein uh, is her name, then there they do contain in the majority, these lists of hypotheses, which makes it much, hard, much easier to identify these hypotheses. So what we observe here is that students do on average better than researchers. Let's go to the second part. As I said in the main message, only 40% of the hypotheses were good and 18.6 18 of pre-registrations were good. Well, the students who are first year students, they were shocked by the low quality of the hypotheses. And uh, like us, and if we look at what criteria were violated most, it was single, many hypotheses combined a lot of things and uh, understandable. Sometimes we, we couldn't figure out what, what was actually meant in uh, the hypothesis. And here too, we ask ourselves, hey, do students better than researchers? And, and my answer is yes. If we compare this, how students do uh, their research and they list hypotheses. Also, there's hardly any, any evidence of publication bias in student theses. Um, they often do power analyses. And on average, they also had higher sample sizes. And if we go to PhD thesis, also there, uh, there's a rather famous research of a boil that compared PhD thesis and articles that came out of it. And PhD thesis also fare better than research, and I would say also pre registrations. Now, um, why then do students do better than researchers? Because uh, we, we try to explain for ourselves how come that pre registrations concerning hypotheses are so bad. And one obvious explanation is that only bad students become researchers. And, and the good students, they do something that is really valuable to society. But another explanation is sloppiness. And uh, I do not believe in the first explanation. I think it's sloppiness that researchers can make hypotheses well, just like our first year students but they do not yet take pre-registration seriously and or do not fully understand the purpose that you have to specify this path for uh, your research from hypotheses to the final conclusion. Now, the final conclusion of this talk is then that science and scientists still generally 
have a lot to learn and must do their best, be must do their best when pre-registering hypotheses and I would say uh, doing research. I tell this, uh, yeah, uh, I, I, give, I teach a lot about meta science also to students and they get uh, a bit depressed eh, when I talk about the state of science. But then I always tell this story and I would like to tell this short story to you too. And it's a lesson on humility. What is a rather famous story, at least in the Netherlands, is that uh, the lesson on humility that the human, human uh, species on earth, if we uh, express that this time that we are on, earth on a full day, then we are living only in the last 38 seconds of this day. We are very recent on this planet. And so we are not that significant. We can also do this for humans doing science. And here, if we see human life as one day, only in the last 13 seconds, we do science. So we have just started doing science. We cannot expect that we do everything perfect. And we are like, say, the cavemen of humans. The, the, the scientists are just starting. And so uh, don't, don't be depressed. Uh, there's, we have just started. Now, that was my, uh, my talk. Uh, thank you uh, for listening. And if there are questions, if there's still time for questions, then go ahead. Okay, thank you, Marcel. Um, the Q&A is open, uh, but there's no questions yet. So I'll just, let's just wait a couple of minutes. And in the meanwhile, I was uh, wondering, so I was particularly struck by the difference between researchers and students. And you're saying, okay, the most common explanation is that researchers are maybe a bit more sloppy. So how can you think, well, how do you think we can improve this? Um, how can we make researchers less sloppy, so to say? Yeah, I, I don't know. I think it's a state of mind that people think, okay, let's just write down in the day or an hour what I plan to do. As, it's, as, as uh, it is just a piece of paper next to the computer, not really taking it so seriously as, as uh, belonging to the research itself. Pre the pre-registration is, is the basis of the research. Uh, it should be just as important or maybe even more important than the paper following from it because the paper should be the result of what is promised in the pre-registration. So I think people don't understand the value of, of pre-registration. Yeah, that's fair enough. Uh, so there's a question uh, by Bob Reed. So they say, uh, it seems to me that this is another argument for the benefit of replication, because the hypothesis is well-defined after the research has been done. Um, do you agree with that? Yeah, but uh, wouldn't it be good if already the original research is okay? Huh? So if the original research already specifies the hypothesis well, if there is one at least, huh? maybe you have exploratory research and then you don't have to uh, need to have a well-specified hypothesis maybe. But if you have uh, planned research, then I would say, try to figure out what is the hypothesis immediately, write it down well, and also specify then how you assess the variable, how do you test, etc. So I agree that, <laughs> Uh, for replication, uh, we, we can construct the hypothesis precisely, but please let's do it also for the original research. All right, thank you. One final thought I had myself um, is that it might have to do with consequences. So for students, uh, they have to be strict in, in listing their hypotheses, otherwise they get a bad grade. But maybe there are just is a lack of consequences when researchers uh, do not adhere by this, uh, by strict rules of science, so to say. Yeah. True. Um, even uh, researchers are punished when they list their hypotheses. So if you write, list your hypothesis and you submit your paper, then you may get a reviewer who says, ah, don't list your hypothesis, it's, 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 it's childish. I remember when I became a PhD student, and did my first research in visual perception. My supervisor said to me, I had listed the hypothesis, ah, we don't do that. 
that's silly, that's childish. But we require our students to do so because for us, it's very easy to check the work of the students if they list their hypotheses. Now, and it's the same, of course, for researchers. We can also check work of our fellow colleagues much better if they list their hypotheses. Forget about childies, we just want good science. All right, thank you. I think we'll go on to the next speaker, uh, which is me. So I'll uh, share my screen. All right, so I'm uh, happy to announce the second speaker, uh, which is myself. Uh, so my name is uh, Omo van den Akker, and I'm part of the Meta Research Center at Tilburg University. And um, yeah, I'm gonna talk to you about effectiveness of peer registration in psychology, which is one of the main themes of my uh, PhD. And um, well, this title, I guess, uh, begs the question, uh, what is peer registration effectiveness? When is a peer registration uh, actually effective in achieving its goal? So we devised this simple formula. Uh, peer registration effectiveness is pre-registration specificity and pre-registration study consistency. So the first part, pre-registration pre specificity is about, okay, how many details are in the pre-registration? Are, are all important study elements covered? Um, are they extensively covered so that you are actually able to do the research? So I also call this uh, producibility, which is a bit of a tongue in cheek uh, comparison to reproducibility. You know, in a paper, if everything is really detailed, you can reproduce the study. So then that reproducibility is high. Uh, but you can also make this uh, reasoning for a pre-registration. You know, if the pre-registration is really um, extensively outlined, you know, if everything is in there, then it's possible to produce uh, the research. So I will be using specificity and producibility uh, interchangeably um, from now on. Um, and there's also pre-registration study consistency. So uh, what you plan in the pre-registration should match what you're actually doing uh, in your study. And we need both. So they are both uh, necessary in order for pre-registration pre to be effective. So we can have a, a really high specificity. So the, the pre-registration is really detailed, but if you then just do other stuff instead of what you planned out to do, then still uh, the benefit of pre-registration is lost. Uh, likewise, you can have a really high consistency between your pre registered plan and your study. But if you only pre registered, like, let's say one hypothesis and not, not even anything about how you're gonna test that hypothesis, then also um, it's not really effective to pre register that. So we need th both these elements. Uh, and I'm gonna zo zoom in on both these elements in, the, in this talk. So uh, these elements have been looked at individually so uh, Marianne Bakker, which is another of my uh, thesis supervisors, looked at uh, specificity of pre-registrations. And Alina Klaas and others looked at uh, registration study consistency. And both studies showed uh, that there's uh, ample room for improvement. Uh, but they did look at these things separately. So what we try to do is look at them together. And also we try to uh, have a bigger sample. So what we basically did was we looked at all pre-registrations we could find. Um, for example, from the pre-registration challenge. So this was a challenge hosted by uh, the Center for Open Science in which researchers um, got $1,000 if they published a pre-registered pre study. Uh, so this was done to uh, increase uptake of pre-registration. So we had 180 uh, papers that uh, won a pre-registration challenge prize and we include those in the sample. And we also used um, papers with pre-registration badges. So that's also an in initiative by the Center of Open Science where papers that have uh, open data, for example, can, can get a certain badge, but also papers that have at least one study that is pre-registered can have a, a badge. And there were 244 of those. So quite a big sample of uh, pre-registrations. Uh, we did exclude some, uh, no studies from other fields in psychology because we wanted to focus on psychology. Um, no studies based on secondary data, because that pre-registering pre -registering those studies is a little bit more complex. Uh, I actually wrote a paper about that, uh, 
please look it up if you're interested in this topic. And um, also no registered reports because it's also a slightly different way of pre-registering because the review is at the beginning of the process instead of at the end. So all of this resulted in a total sample size of 484 studies from 281 papers. So we looked at these um, in two parts. So in part one, we looked at hypotheses. So Marcel already uh, talked about the specificity of these hypotheses or the quality of these hypotheses. And basically his conclusion was that it was kind of a, a bad hypothesis contest. Uh, so I actually looked this up. This is actually a thing where uh, people do a stand-up comedy evening and they come up with ridiculous hypotheses. And then uh, they try to, uh, during their routine, they try to support these hypotheses by all kinds of uh, evidence, like spurious correlations and stuff. So uh, yeah, this got me thinking that uh, the field of psychology might just be one big bad hypothesis contest, but that might be too uh, negative of a take. Um, we also looked at pre-registration paper consistency. Um, so between uh, pre-registration and the paper, uh, do the hypotheses match up, yes or no? And what we find, what we found was that about half of the pre-registered hypotheses were omitted. So they were there in the pre-registration, but in the accompanying paper, they were no longer there. We also found that about half of the studies add non-pre-registered hypotheses. So they just um, add hypotheses that were not in a pre-registration. And they did not specif specify explicitly that they were exploratory. So um, we call those added hypotheses. Um, but we have to take into account here that uh, the quality of hypotheses, both in pre-registrations and in papers, is, is rather low. So um, it could be that our results here were skewed a little bit because of that. You know, if you have a double-barreled hypothesis, for example, you know, is the whole thing a hypothesis or is uh, each individual barrel an hypothesis? So because of that ambiguity, uh, we might have found a little bit too negative results here. This is actually another project and the one I'm gonna talk about now. Because in part two, we looked at other study elements than hypotheses. So for example, we looked at variables, uh, statistical model, uh, how statistical assumptions are handled, outliers, those kind of things. And again, we looked at specificity or producibility and pre-registration paper consistency. So how effective is pre-registration on these other study elements? So here you can see a list of all the things we looked at, uh, and we categorized them, some of them as essential and some of them as non-essential. So essential elements are elements that are directly related to the empirical cycle you see on the right. And we think these elements, these five things, they need to be present in each pre-registration uh, because these are basically the backbone of a scientific study. So we have uh, the variables, independent and dependent, are part of the design of the study. A data collection procedure is part of the well the data collection procedure. Um, the statistical model is part of the analysis and the inference criteria are part of the interpretation. So we also collect the data of these non-essential elements, uh, missing data, inclusion, exclusion criteria. These are all, all things, uh, also things where uh, p-hacking is possible, but we found them a little bit less essential to uh, a research study. Uh, so we're not, discussing those, uh, those in this paper, in, uh, in this talk, uh, mainly due to time constraints as well. So we're focusing on the top five uh, study elements. Um, we collected data for only 55 out of the 484 pre-registration study pairs. Uh, so data collection is still underway. Um, we actually still need coders for that. So if you're interested, uh, let me know. And this data is based on only one hypothesis per pre-registration study pair. So uh, in part one, we found hypotheses, right? And um, now for each pre-registration study pair, we looked at all hypotheses that were both present in the pre-registration and in the paper. And then we randomly selected one of those. So we have one hypothesis per pre-registration study pair that we uh, actually scored these elements for. So these are the results. So first, we're going to look at uh, manipulated independent variables. So here you can see um, that in the pre-registration, 
we found a manipulated independent variable 40, uh, 40 times out of 55. And you see two colors, green and red. And green means that the information about this manipulated independent variable was producible. So based on information that was provided in the peer registration, it is definitely possible to actually use this uh, variable in a study. Red, however, indicates that that is not possible. So the information is too scarce, too limited, uh, maybe something is missing. Uh, so in those cases, it was, it's not possible really to use this variable in a study because the you know, information is just not there. So green is producible, red is non-producible. That's with regard to the pre-registration. For the paper, it's similar, uh, but we're talking about reproducibility now because it's about the paper and uh, it's about redoing the stuff because it's already been done because it's been published. So green is, there's a lot of information about this variable in the paper, uh, enough that we can reproduce this variable in a new study. And red means that there is a lack of information in the paper. So here we see that at least in the pre registration, quite some information is missing about the manipulated independent variable. So that is a problem, of course, because if the information is missing, we can also not compare it uh, to the paper. And that is what we did here. So this is a graph in which we look at pre registration paper consistency. So of all the um, registrations and papers that included information about the manipulated independent variable. We were able to compare those because there was information there. Of all those, most of them are consistent. So green means there is consistency in the manipulated independent variable between the pre-registration and the paper. Red means it's inconsistent. So there is a change uh, in this variable. And as you can see here, it's 21 of them had information for both the pre-reg and the paper. And you can see here in this graph that indeed uh, the bottleneck here is the pre-registration. Th those were often not uh, specific enough to be able to do this comparison. So the problem here lies, I guess, with the producibility of the pre-registration. Uh, we can also look at independent variables that were not manipulated. So these were just measured. Um, this could be uh, like scales, uh, measuring some kind of construct, but also things like uh, gender, for example. And uh, we split this up into three things, uh, the procedure, values, and construction. So the procedure is, okay, how is this variable measured? Um, for gender, it could be, okay, it was measured using a questionnaire with uh, Altrix. Uh, for an EEG, for example, an EEG variable, and then the procedure of the EEG should be present here. And you can see here um, that Green, again, is producibility, red is non-producibility, and it also holds for the paper. And you see that, uh, again, the pre-registration is not really specific about the procedure um, that, are, that is used in these variables. Um, the second picture is about values. So this means uh, which potential values can this variable take? So for gem gender, it would be uh, male, female, uh, non-binary, I guess. Um, and for the EEG, this would be a range of values but they need to specify this, right? Otherwise they can uh, tweak this in between the pre-registration and the paper. So again, you see that it's not always perfect, but I guess the majority of the times uh, there is enough information, there is information about the potential values uh, of these measures. Then third on the right side, uh, we have construction. And we, what we mean by that is uh, we only refer to uh, variables that are constructed out of other variables, so for example, scale consisting of several items. So what we need to know then is how are these items uh, transformed into the scale? So are, are we just summing all the item scores? Are we taking the average? Uh, are we truncating anything? Uh, of course, this needs to be specified as well in the pre-registration. And you can see here that it's not always the case. Uh, and it's definitely not always the case in the paper. So the paper often op omits information about how um, the individual items are synthetized, synthesized into a general score. So that uh, is problematic. And then on to the consistency of all these elements of in independent variables. So here, this is a sea of green, so that's good news. So whenever there is a sufficient information in both the pre-registration and the paper, then uh, basically for each of these 
uh, elements, that then the pre-registration and the paper are consistent. So that, that's good news for pre-registration effectiveness. Uh, we did the same thing for the dependent variable. Again, we did look at the procedure to measure this variable, the values it could take, and uh, how in the composite val uh, variables are constructed based on individual, individual variables. That's construction. And here you see, uh, I guess the pattern here is that pre-registrations are less producible than papers are reproducible. So you can see here the bottleneck is again, uh, based on the left two pictures, is with the pre-registration. Those are often not specific enough, not um, producible enough to be able to compare these different study elements, which of course is a problem if you want to assess pre-registration effectiveness. And the picture does get more positive again when we're looking at the consistency between the pre-registration and the paper. So dependent variables are usually um, consistent between the pre-registration and the paper. Although the potential values that the dependent value dependent variable can take sometimes aren't. So it could be that some kind of p-hacking involves uh, tweak tweaking the values of the dependent variable, uh, truncating them, for example. We also looked at the data collection procedure. So how is the data collected? And there's two elements here, a sample size. That's basically how many people are you going to test or did you test? And we have the sampling frame and that's the procedure of the data collection. So we were, uh, we were at a supermarket and on that day and within uh, four hours, we approached as many people as possible. Something like that, that's a sampling frame. So let's start with the left picture. Uh, the right side is totally, uh, the right side of the left picture is fully green. So in the paper, the sample size is always provided. Uh, so that's good. But in the paper or in a pre-registration, that's not always the case. Uh, of course, it's a really important element of a pre-registration to uh, specify the sample size. But you see here uh, in red, that's not always the case. Uh, with the right picture, um, the sampling frame, this is uh, mainly red. So here this means, okay, both in the pre-registration and in the paper, um, researchers do not provide a lot of information about this. Um, so they don't really specify how this data was collected exactly, at least not to an extent that we could easily do it again or do, it, do, the, do the data collection ourselves. A few minutes, Olmo. Yeah. Okay. Um, here we have uh, sample sizes, uh, left in the pre-registration, right in the published paper. And we're of course interested in the difference between those. And uh, let's look at the right graph here. And this is the relative sample size differences. And you can see that sometimes the, the, the sample sizes are way higher, sometimes way a little bit lower. Um, but of course, the most important information here is why is it lower and why is it higher? Um, we also have data on that, uh, but it's not analyzed yet. So I have to, uh, you know, I can't say anything about that, unfortunately. Uh, I can say more about the statistical model. Here we see uh, also a little bit of a gray. What that means is that, uh, so researchers should say something about it, and gray means they, they say nothing at all about it. So in some cases, they have a pre-registration without referring to anything of a statistical model. Uh, we, I guess we can see the same patterns, except for the details of the statistical model. So the model itself is there, both in the pre-reg and the paper. The variables are there, both in the pre-reg and the paper. But the details, so how did they use, do they use robust standard errors, for example, that's often missing information. And again, when the information is there, both in the pre-registration and the paper, usually it is consistent uh, between them. So that is uh, one of the elements of pre-registration effectiveness. And in this case, again, uh, it looks good. Then our final element, which is inference criteria. So here we see a lot of gray in the pre-registration. So most often in a pre-registration, they don't say anything about inference criteria. They don't say, okay, we're gonna use alpha as 0.05 or something like that. Uh, they, I guess they just take it as given. Um, and in the paper, uh, they also often don't uh, mention that. 
um, that's why the, we see this uh, red uh, bar on the right. Um, so this means that they uh, only implicitly say it. So gray is they don't say anything at all. Red is that they implicitly say something about inference criteria. So they use uh, asterisks in a table with p-values, for example. Green is that they actually say, okay, we use this alpha. We couldn't compare many of them because they were just not, not enough information, uh, but usually the inference criteria were consistent between illustration and paper. So all of this, what does this amount to? Um, I think this is an important slide of this talk. So left, we can see what happened with registered reports. So this is a slide by Anna Schill. We can see that in registered reports, the number of the proportion of positive results significantly uh, goes down. Uh, presumably because it avoids p-hacking and publication bias. Now, we have also our own results, and that's kind of in the middle between various reports and actual and original papers. So, and this makes sense, right? Because in peer illustrations, like standard peer illustrations, we don't avoid publication bias because it's not part of the review process, but we do avoid some forms of p-hacking, we hope. So this actually indicates that at least some forms of p-hacking are um, are prevented. So here you can see it together with the other uh, bars. You can indeed see that it's somewhere in between. So this, in my book, uh, indicates that pre-registration seems to be working at least somewhat. So finally, to wrap up, um, one, selective hypothesis reporting seems to be prevalent in psychology. Two, it is hard to compare pre-registration and papers because uh, they lack Producible slash reproducible information. Two, when information is available, then most pre registrations align with their corresponding uh, papers. Should be papers there. And four, um, pre registration does seem to have the expected effects on the proportion of positive results in the literature because it's somewhere in between the proportion of British reports and of original studies. I think the actual uh, percentage was 66%. So main takeaway, to reap the benefits of pre-registration, uh, pre-registration producibility and paper reproducibility should be significantly improved. Uh, so it seems to be working a little bit, but there is way uh, ample room for improvement. So these are my co-authors on the left for a selective hypothesis reporting project and for the right on the pre-registration effectiveness reporting, uh, pre-registration effectiveness project. And we're still collecting data. So we're still looking for coders. So if you are interested, please uh, send me an email. You can do that on this email address. You can also uh, shoot me a message on uh, Twitter. And of course, all our studies were pre-registered. You can find your pre-registrations pre here. And when we're done with the analyses, uh, all data will be publicly available, of course. All right, that's it uh, on my behalf. And uh, I'm open for questions. So there's one by Marcel, which he uh, put forward in the chat, but it's only the chat for the hosts and the panelists. So I guess the other people attending can see it. But his question is, uh, do you have a suggestion how to improve the quality of pre-registrations? Uh, I guess I do. I think uh, we need first, we need to improve the infrastructure surrounding pre-registrations. So now there are some templates available. Um, and um, I think those are really useful because they are like a, a guideline people can use to actually do a good pre-registration because it is really hard, especially if you have to, you have to, if you have to start from scratch. So these uh, pre-registration templates can really help. And um, there's uh, more and more templates on uh, open science framework as well. So please check that out if you're looking to pre-register your studies. And, there's also a question in the Q&A by uh, Eric Olson. So it says, in terms of clarifying the value of prereq, where does the responsibility for increasing this clarity reside? Um, so I guess, yeah, is, is it the researcher? Is it educators? Is it funders, maybe? 
Um, so he's saying there's not one stakeholder, uh, but what can the success of students tell us? Uh, I guess this one is also re related to the uh, previous talk. Um, but this is a good question. So where, how can we improve pre-registration effectiveness? Is it, should it come from researchers themselves? I'm actually of the opinion that it should be a top-down effort. So um, I'm a big proponent of peer registration, despite some results not being definitely, uh, definitely saying that peer registration is effective. But I still think, think that uh, funders should mandate that peer registration happens. Uh, because a little pre registration is better than non pre registration at all. And I think it's mainly about uh, um, money or slash power. So uh, funders have the money and the power, so they can dictate what's happening in the scientist community, basically. So if we all agree that pre registration is a good thing, they have to say, okay, let's, uh, let's get this done. Uh, every time you submit something, it needs to be pre, -re pre registered. So I think that's where. Um, the main improvement uh, lies. Any other questions or should we go to the next speaker? I guess we can continue. So um, next up is uh, George Afosu. He's an uh, assistant professor in comparative politics at the London School of Economics and uh, Political Science. And he's published about uh, political accountability, uh, election integrity, but he's also interested in transparency in science. Uh, and that's actually uh, why he's here, uh, because he's talked to us about pre-registration in economics and political science. And it's not called pre-registration there, but it's called uh, pre-analysis plans. So uh, please tell us more, uh, George. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Omo, for the introduction. And uh, I think I, uh, I share uh, a lot of the uh, comments by the previous presenters. I think there, there is similar trends of what they have shared in political science and uh, economics as well. Uh, my, this uh, work was done by myself and Daniel Posner at the uh, University of California in Los Angeles. And uh, what we try to do in political science and uh, economics was essentially to take a stock at uh, what has happened in the past uh, few years when the trends of pre-registration kicked off in political science and, and in economics. Uh, we didn't set up to do anything that was causally identified, um, you know, try to find the effect of perhaps pre-registration on issues of fishing and hacking that has been alluded to in the previous presentation. But we set for ourselves a simple question, which was, the way that pubs are being written now uh, within, the, so within political science and economics, do they have the um, characteristics, they have the ability to check fishing and hacking? So that's like the simple question that we set for ourselves. So our approach was quite simple. It was basically to draw a uh, registered pre-analysis plan on the American Economic Association and the Evidence in Governance and Politics Registries. These are the two main registries that we knew of where uh, at the time, uh, political scientists uh, and economists were registering their parts. Uh, political sciences, uh, scientists mainly on EGAP and the economists mainly registered their, their, their studies on the AEA registry. We analyzed the content of this PAPS that we drew from this registries to find out whether 
you know, things were clearly specified and comprehensive enough to limit the scope for fishing and hacking. Uh, then we also try to assess whether PUPS indeed tied the hands of researchers uh, by comparing, uh, I think as Omo did uh, in, his, in his study, uh, compare the pre-registered analysis uh, to the publicly available papers uh, that came out of this pre-registration to see whether they indeed were tiring uh, scholars' hands on what got reported. But we also conducted surveys with PUP users uh, who obviously were registered on the EGAP website, but also on the Innovation, Innovation for Poverty Actions uh, website. We sent emails and survey to about 664 scholars and receive about 155 responses. The idea was to get the perception of scholars regarding the use of this pre-analysis plan. Because in as much as we try to advocate for the use of pre-analysis plans, I think uh, how scholars experience the use of this analysis plan, and I will mention a couple of things that are on the minds of scholars on you know, how this might uh, impact on the way they publish, uh, how they get rewarded in the academy and so on. Uh, that was important for trying to think about the way we use pre-analysis plan uh, in the social sciences. So there is a limit obviously to the approach we adopted. First, you know, these judgments are necessarily subjective. And I think uh, I, I was quite uh, impressed by Marcel and obviously Omo's presentation on the very precise nature they define how they, they think about what is a, a good hypothesis, uh, for example. And I think it's very useful for us to use that as we move forward. But we had very simple criteria of you know, having X, having an impact on Y with a specified direction of effect uh, as a clear hypothesis. But again, it's sometimes can be subjective in, within, this, within this realm of, of, of thought. Uh, our analysis is not causal, uh, but we believe that the stock taking, uh, you know, help us to think about how we adopt this uh, mechanism to increase the credibility of social sciences. So why is it important? I think uh, Omo, Omo showed this trend, you know, in political science and economics, this has kicked off from 2011 when the first pre-analysis plans were registered. Now we are talking, you know, in, in 2000s and so of pre-registration uh, pre uh, in this field. Uh, we teach graduate students that this is the new trends in the field, you definitely have to do it. And so uh, we want to figure out whether there are any benefit to the reasons why we promote pre-analysis plans. The other thing is that it takes a lot of time. And this came from the survey of scholars in the field in the field we asked them how long it took them to write a pre-analysis plan and about more than a quarter suggested that it took them more than a month uh, about 31 percent or 32 percent suggested two to four weeks so it's very time consuming so if we dedicate all this time we teach students uh, to do this we really want to know whether it's beneficial um, the more critical and deep uh, question surrounding the use of pre-analysis plan in political science and social uh, uh, and economics has been an argument about costs to social scientific discoveries. Many of the view that, of course, uh, if you tie yourself to a pre-specified hypothesis, then it tie your hands to exploring the data and that limits potential breakthroughs that come from unexpected surprise findings from the data. It forces researchers, they say, uh, to undertake analysis that are inappropriate when you have the data in your hands. And uh, others are also concerned that it invites uh, scoping. So especially for young scholars who pre-specify the idea and uh, don't have the money to run uh, things in time, 
uh, they might be scooped by other scholars who are well placed to conduct the research and, and take uh, their, their ideas uh, of them. So these are sort of some of the concerns in, 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 in the field. So the motivation for, for our study. Uh, and I think the other thing is uh, pubs are unlikely to um, enhance a research credibility if policing is not rigorous. So unlike you know, you know, Omo, Omo and others who are taking this seriously, taking pubs and comparing what people registered to what is eventually published, uh, it's really hard to see any types of reward that the discipline offer for people who do work like this. And I think this is coming up and we need to be encouraged, uh, but you know, it wasn't, it wasn't there. Uh, so there is all this benefit in theory that we think we should gain from pre-analysis plan, uh, but it also uh, comes with cost, even if it's alleged. And we need obviously to investigate whether this costs are real. Uh, our early um, stock taking was just to provide such benefits. So this is the description of the sample that we used. We had about 200 uh, pubs, 47%, uh, 48% had some publications attached to them and that's the sample we could compare uh, the, the, the pubs with the published papers. 50% uh, were gated. And so what we did was essentially write to this authors to share them with us uh, in confidence. So our description is just a description of the whole pubs, but not for individual pubs. 50% uh, were in the AEA website uh, and the other half on the other side. So most of the pubs we analyze are more concentrated in 2015, 2016, but the trends we discover uh, apply to the area earlier periods as well, uh, which we show in the paper. In the field, uh, most of pre-analysis plans uh, for field experiments and survey experiments, there's hardly any for observational studies. So it's not very clear how to write pubs for observational study yet. Uh, given that there is questions about whether people saw the data before we wrote the plan, and so it's not very common in the field. We have a common rubric which we used, uh, at least two coders, either uh, ourselves or our, our, our research assistants helped to code all the pre-analysis plans and their uh, related papers. Uh, when we wanted to code for clarity of definition, like critical, which is critical to reducing uh, fission, we followed Orkin's uh, criterion, which is if we should give this path to two programmers, uh, they should be able to come up with the same results for the primary independent variable and the dependent variable in the pre-analysis plans. Okay. So can PAPS, as they are written in uh, political science and economics now, reduce the scope for fission? So fission is made possible if there is imprecise definition or lack of clarity about the economic model. So the, the way you would analyze the data uh, on the outcome variables, the coding rules, whether covariates are clearly specified and sufficiently uh, clear uh, the subsamples that will be involved in the analysis, inclusion criterion, uh, among others, to be involved in the analysis. If these things are clear, then there is uh, obviously a hand tying situation where you cannot, we can really compare what you specify to what is got reported in the paper. Uh, so inadvertently or uh, nefariously, uh, if these things are not clear, uh, then you know it leaves room for uh, fishing or hacking. So what do we find? Uh, we find that about 77% of the time, the dependent variables in the pre-analysis plans that we specified uh, were judged to be clearly specified. 93% uh, of independent variables were also judged to be clarified. And I think the independent variables and treatment variables, because of often time, 
is related to a field experiment, that is always quite clear. But when it comes to the dependent variable, uh, scholars are a bit hand wavy about it. Uh, but you know, 70%, 77% is pretty high, given that this is an early stock taking uh, exercise. What about the statistical models that people wanted to run? And this also, we use the same criterion as has been mentioned by previous uh, presenters. 68% clearly specified a precise statistical model that will run, uh, but only 37% specified how they would estimate standard errors. Uh, in 19% of cases, uh, the model that were presented in the paper differed from the one that were pre-specified and such deviations were only mentioned only once. So obviously um, it's, it's okay to, I mean, deviate from what was specified, especially when you thought uh, post filing of the pre-analysis plan that this is not the right specification, but at least to acknowledge in the paper that this was different from what we pre-specified is a measure of transparency in our view. 25% um, of PAPs um, specify how they would deal with missing data. Only 8% specify how they would deal with outliers. 20% dealt with how they would deal with uh, covariate imbalance. And so this gives a lot of room for maneuvering uh, as well uh, to generate particular results. So there's, there's a lot of room in this regard for improvement in, in political science and economics. So can we, can, um, can pre-analysis plans uh, reduce hacking? So hacking is made possible obviously through uh, imprecision about the specific hypothesis that the, the researcher intends to test. Uh, search would, implies that researchers can move goalposts, uh, interpret ex post uh, what the data uh, had to say, uh, which is not based in theory that was pre-specified. So 90% of the time, the analysis, the PAPs we studied specified a clear hypothesis. So this is, you know, scholars were really good about, about that. However, the scope for fishing can come uh, can also come from specifying too many hypotheses. So it turns out that even though scholars were careful about specifying clear hypotheses, they also specified a lot of them, which meant that there's room for us to pick and choose which one we get to report uh, at the end of the day in the papers that we publish. Um, so, for example, 34% uh, 30, of PAF, uh, PAPs pre-specified one to five hypotheses, which is, you know, obviously a good number, but many pre-specified way more. So six to 10, 11 to 20, and a, a, about 8% pre-specified 50 plus uh, hypotheses. But obviously this is not a problem uh, if scholars specify that, well, amongst all this hypothesis that I have specified, these are the primary ones, and these are just secondary ones that I'll be exploring at the end of the day. But even that, we fall short, there's people, you know, scholars specify too many paths, uh, too many hypotheses. Uh, among the, uh, among the, the plans we looked at, 42% uh, specified only one to five as their primary, but by 3%, 50% or more, uh, six to 10 hypothesis, 25%. So there's still a lot more of uh, hypotheses that are specified as primary, even if we restrict our sense to that. Another safeguard uh, to, uh, to so many hypotheses is to commit to multiple testing adjustments. Uh, here, um, you know, among scholars who were pre-specifying five or more hypotheses, just 28% pre-committed to doing so. But do scholars take advantage of this latitude that they give themselves in, in terms of specifying too many hypotheses 
or not uh, specifying adjustment and so on. We find that all tests faithfully presented the results of all the uh, pre-registered primary hypothesis in 61% of cases. More than one third of cases had at least uh, one pre-registered uh, pre hypothesis that was never reported. Uh, the median neglected hypothesis was about 25%. So a lot of stuff, so very consistent with what Omar, Omar presented in his, in his work as well. 18% um, of papers presented new hypotheses which were not pre-specified. And in 82%, uh, this new, new hypothesis were never identified as new. Uh, so they don't mention, mention them at all. So given this, what did we take as a, you know, a most complete uh, part? I think there are, there are a lot of dimensions uh, by which we can analyze what a good PAPS is. Um, we think that there are four main criteria for what a good PAPS should be. It should have a precise hypothesis, um, a precise independent variable, precise dependent variable, and a precise statistical model. We think that this four criterion is very important. And I think Omo's suggestion about um, the mode of inference is important here. And I think we should consider that as uh, part of a complete PAPS. So here, if we look at the distribution, oh, sorry, um, a lot of, about more than half of our PAPS met the four criteria, which was, which is quite really good. We would take that as a, a glass half, half full but there were uh, a lot, also many more that fell short of this four key criteria. Uh, with regards to the challenges or the objections to PAPS, we try to take some lessons from what people said in the surveys that we conducted. You know, obviously time consuming, does it stifle discovery? Does it hamper publication? Uh, and is there enough policing to make sure that uh, PAPs are effective in what we think they should be doing? Uh, composing PAPs, people thought, took a lot of time, as I have mentioned already. Uh, but people thought that there were positive angles to this time-consuming exercise. 18% thought that the, the project led to a refinement of their research protocols and data collection and plans, which is like an improvement in, in the research uh, process. So you refine, you get to refine your research protocols before you even implement it, get comments from people uh, and improve, improve the quality of your research. 65% uh, said it put them in a position to receive such useful feedback. 52% uh, said uh, they experienced downstream time savings. So once you write a pub, uh, obviously downstream, that works pretty well in terms of time, time saving. Um, but, you know, negative, 34% said writing parts delayed the implementation of their project. The trade-off, so it appears that uh, there's a shift in workload in the, uh, from the backstage to the front stage. So you do much of the work in the front stage but it's not very clear that on net, they generate significantly more work, uh, according to the interviews we had with, with scholars using PAPS. Uh, does it limit the scope for discovery? I think, I mean, this is obviously hard to tell, uh, but if you ask scholars, uh, you know, they don't seem to think that it limits, uh, closely less than half, they didn't think that it limited them at all but a huge proportion also said somewhat or quite a bit. So this is obviously quite a concern in the field that you know, writing a pub can limit the scope for discovery. Um, others say you know, it, that it, you, you sort of write, uh, it's, it seems like a report that you don't seem to write a convincing, theoretically interesting paper that will get published in high-end journals. This is a concern, but what we try to do 
uh, as a follow-up to this study was to look at whether this is this has some credence in in the data we take we took a look at the mbr working papers those who mentioned whether they used any form of experiment in their work about 11 percent or so had that and whether they mentioned that they used any PAPs. So only 8% said they did uh, compared to 92%. Then we looked whether these papers were eventually published or not published. So at this stage, we see that there is a high probability for those who did not use PAPs to get published compared to those who did not use PAPs. So this on the face of it gives some credence to that concern. However, we see that once published, uh, those that use PAPS had about 61% chance of being published in the top five journals in economics uh, compared to uh, those that didn't use PAP. So yes, you know, in my limits publication, but it seems like you learned well when you write a PAP. We also see a high rate of citation for, uh, for papers that use PAPS. Okay, thank you. Um, so the balance sheet, uh, just to end, just to end my presentation. It appears that uh, PAPs as they are currently being written are not doing everything that, you know, we thought they would do. It doesn't tie hands as much as we thought they would. Uh, many parts are not su uh, sufficiently clear uh, in terms of their hypothesis uh, to prevent hacking. Uh, the details they provide are insufficient, not precise enough to prevent fishing. Uh, people, uh, papers do not always follow the pubs that were registered and uh, you know, deviations deviations from the pubs are not always faithfully reported. However, the majority of pubs, as we uh, analyze, are quite sufficiently clear. Uh, they are precise enough, uh, comprehensive, uh, to limit the scope for fishing and hacking. So the, the, there's a, a halfway there. So we, we view, as I mentioned from the start, we view this as a glass half full, and I agree with Marcel's point that we just at the beginning of this process, they started in 2011 in the case of political science and, and, and economics. And so, you know, this is a start of the process. We are all learning. And I think there's room for improvement. We need to, you know, clearly specify what should go into a pub. Um, there are, you know, uh, some few recommendations from other scholars, but as a, uh, as, a, as a field, uh, we haven't clearly specified what should go into a PAPS and what constitutes a sufficient uh, PAP. The next step for us is that we are, we, we are going to assess whether there has been any progress, uh, especially along the four dimensions that I mentioned, potentially uh, add uh, almost recommendation about inference. Um, as for 2019 and, and 2020. Coding is uh, ongoing for us and uh, we, hope, we hope to uh, show how much progress we have made and what might explain uh, if we have made any progress, what might explain uh, such a progress. So thank you very much for your attention. All right, thank you, George. Um, I'll open the floor for the Q&A. Uh, there's also already a question by Marcel van Assen, who asks, uh, are there many templates for uh, P-analysis plans? So do journals have these templates or are there general templates uh, that economists and uh, political scientists can use? Uh, so, so there are, there are no, like there are no templates, but I think, um, so there are a couple of newly published uh, papers um, that try to give guidance on 
exactly what should go into pubs. So the eGAP, for example, also have like some sort of a template on what people should put into their pubs for registration. So they have very, you know, few things. Uh, they, they, they are sort of uh, key elements that eGAP asks scholars to specify. And so does the AEA uh, also have a couple of things that people should specify. So hypothesis, clarity, clarity of hypothesis, sample size, uh, and things like that are asked by this regist registry. So there is a, that kind of template uh, that is available. But obviously, where, you know, whether scholars specify this element precisely enough uh, to aid reproducibility, to aid to 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 tie scholars' hand is another question. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Bob Breed also has a question. So you mentioned uh, four key elements, and you also alluded that uh, inference criteria might be a, a good addition to that, to that uh, the list of important elements. And Bob Breed asks, okay, but should um, the specification of how the sample is assembled, shouldn't that also be one of this uh, list of critical elements that should be in a, in a pub? Um. Yeah, I mean, I think I think it's an important element of pubs in general, and we code that in our in our study. We code uh, multiple multiple things, so sample size, whether there is uh, IRB, the direction, the direction of hypothesis testing, whether it, it will be a um, one sided test versus you know two sided test. We we sort of code all of that, and we think that they are important for for pubs. But in terms of judging whether a pub is complete, um, it's not very, you know, I think theoretically, it's not very clear to me whether, you know, the collect, how you will take your sample, the size of the sample goes into the issue of, of the testing of, you know, the testing of a hypothesis and whether it's supported or not supported by the data you, you use. So a precise, if you know, if we understand pre-analysis plans correctly to be, um, this is what I'm going to test in the world. Uh, this is the independent and dependent variable I'm going to use in testing. That this is my operationalization of this hypothesis. And this is the model specification. And this is how I, I'll come into conclusion as to whether my hypothesis is supported or not, I think like these four elements in, and obviously the direction of test um, would be sufficient enough um, to, to tell us that. All right, thank you, George. Uh, with that, I'll close the Q&A and I will uh, present the next presenter, which is uh, Sarah Ann Field. And she's a PhD student in meta science uh, at Groningen University. Uh, and I believe she only has a half a year left before she has to finish her uh, dissertation. So it's gonna be an exciting next couple of months. Um, she's also part of the executive committee of the platform for young meta scientists, uh, which we call PIMS, I'm also part of that. And uh, this is a community of uh, young meta scientists, early career meta researchers. And we try to keep each other posted uh, about uh, the latest work in meta science. We also host some conferences. Uh, so if there are any early career meta researchers listening, uh, please contact Sarhan or, or me. Uh, maybe we can uh, link up together. Uh, so with that uh, shameless plug, uh, I'll hand over the floor to uh, Sarhan. Uh, please go ahead. Thank you, Omar. So let me just get my slides up. So, uh, as Omar has said, I'm Saran. Thank you for joining us uh, for the end of, almost the end of the last day of the conference. Um, as Omar has said, I'm sharing a little bit about an attempt that uh, myself and some colleagues made to link up trustworthiness and perceptions of trustworthiness with pre-registered uh, findings and registered reports. So I'll just share um, uh, basically that, that article of ours. 
So the idea was to test the hypothesis that people are going to trust findings from pre-registration registered reports more than those that are uh, published using the traditional publishing model, so with, with no registration at all. So it sounds pretty simple. And to me, it sounds quite intuitive. You know, that's one of the, the promises, right, of pre-registration especially, is that when you go to the effort of, of setting out all of your plans, that, that the findings that result from that process are, are probably going to be a little bit more high quality and hopefully a little bit more trustworthy. So again, we wanted to sort of empirically test this. Uh, we we uh, did two studies. Uh, one was sort of a pilot study and the other we, we just called a full study, which uh, was a registered report itself. Um, so we were basically looking to ask about trustworthiness um, of active psychological researchers. So I mined the web of science for email addresses of people who had recently published on psychological topics in, in uh, peer reviewed journals. So the design uh, was a two by three factorial design uh, with the independent variable of registration status, so pre-registration registered reports, and the dependent variable was trust. So with that uh, little outline, I'll just show you basically exactly what we did. Um, so we, we randomized people, uh, people put into one of three different conditions uh, for the independent variable of registration, registered reports. Just a quick caveat, um, I might at times put registered reports and pre-registration together as though they're the same thing, they are definitely not, but sometimes for brevity it's easier to say them um, in the same breath because they have similar benefits and limitations and, and are similar in a lot of senses. Um, so yeah, uh, people were, were put into one of three conditions for the, uh, the study, either or none. So like I said, um, we, let me actually, actually just go a little forwards. No, I'll, I'll stick with this. Very briefly, we showed people a study vignette. So we basically showed them a little fake study and we manipulated pre-registration status within that little tiny fake study. And we asked them, about it after they had read it, after the trust, uh, after they had read the, the little mini study, we asked them about their trust in that study, in those results. So back uh, one step further, um, people in the none condition were not shown any kind of registration at all in their mini study. They just saw a basically just a mini study with some fake uh, results and some simulated data. People who are in the pre-registration condition um, they were shown a little mini study which basically included details that indicated to them that the study had been pre-registered, so that things had been put up on LSF and that kind of thing. And that was intended to make people who were reading that material or that mini study, that was meant to uh, get them to think that it was a pre-registered study. And similarly, the registered report condition contained text in the mini study which indicated that it was a, as actually the result of a registered report and then we asked them after they had read this mini study with the, the manipulations uh, whether they trusted the study or not so it sounds um, maybe a little bit more convoluted than what it actually was it was a pretty simple study i think um, and so i'll just show you um, for the, firstly, the pilot briefly. So this was the mini study that people saw. So as a, just a very brief study description, and you can see highlighted down the bottom there, it says the paper makes no mention of any previously documented sampling plan or study design. So this was a material that someone in the none condition would have seen. So this again is a, a little mini summary or, or a study, um, which is just published in the traditional sense. Um, and then again, once they'd seen that material, um, that little mini study, we asked them how much they trust the results of the study. They indicated that trust on a one to nine Likert scale. Uh, so now in hindsight, that's that's not, you know, it's a little bit too simple. But um, there are a couple of methodological issues with the study that I think I can see in hindsight, but I'll, I'll talk a little bit about those later. And importantly, we also ask them a little bit about their opinions on pre-registration and registered reports as well, which comes in handy later, as I'll, I'll show you. 
Um, when we said, how much do you trust the results of this, this study? We wanted to let give people a bit of a sense of how they should orient their response or orient around the, the question of trust. So it's ideal, obviously, if people are given the chance to sort of have some kind of intuition about what they're being asked, you know, how, how much do you trust the results of this study, that they would intuit what trust means. But participants tend to want to know kind of what you want uh, for them to do. So we gave them some adjectives which helped them kind of think about trust in the way that, that we wanted them to think. Of course, these are not uh, synony uh, synonyms for trust. They are just sort of facets of trust. And we thought that things like a true effect, being reliable or valid, um, they are ways that we evaluate research articles in, in real life. So when we said, how much do you trust the results of the study? That's what we wanted them to sort of think about a little bit. So up until this point, I haven't mentioned the other condition, which is familiarity. I'm not going to because it's completely outside of the scope of this talk and this session, but um, it is in there. So that's what you're seeing uh, is just an extra independent variable. So this plot basically represents what we expected. We expected for the registered report condition to report the highest possible trust ratings out of, out of all of the conditions. But we expected uh, them to perform higher than with a pre-registration condition. And overall, we expected for pre-registration status to be the highest in conditions where there is some kind of registration. So again, we had expected to see that trust would be greatest where there's some kind of registration or pre-registration or registered report in, in the finding. And that's what we see here. So the error bars are relatively big but we do see a relatively neat, uh, somewhat linear trend there. And if you look at the results numerically, uh, they certainly echo that. It's a very strong effect. So we conducted a Bayesian uh, analysis, a Bayesian ANOVA. And because we had two independent variables, we couldn't just um, run a, a normal Bayesian ANOVA. We actually, well, you technically can, but it can be a little bit uh, complex to interpret the results. So we ran, uh, we calculated an inclusion base factor, which basically allows you to compare all of the terms in the model that include one variable in comparison with the rest of the terms in the model. And it basically lets you focus on just one main effect. That's kind of the, the layman's explanation of it. And you can see at the top where I've highlighted here, the pre-registration status effect was, was really quite compelling, regardless of whose sort of criteria of evidence you use, Jeffries or, or Lee and Wachemarkers, it doesn't matter. Um, that's a very, very extreme inclusion-based factor. So including pre-registration status in the model um, it was a good move. And uh, in this case, we can, for the, for the pilot, we can certainly see that pre-registration registered reports does really boost the, the perceptions of trust. So at first blush, that's looking good, right? Because again, people are, people are uptaking this initiative because they want, they want to start increasing trust again in research, right? Where we're, we've seen so much drama with findings lately and so much undermining of trust. We, we wanna know that what we're doing is yielding more trustworthy research, or at least that people think that that's what's going on, that matters, right? So again, to begin with, you know, this is some good stuff with the pilot. Coming across now to the uh, full study results. Um, one difference, so there are two differences between the pilot and the full study. The pilot had a simpler study vignettes. We conducted a qualitative, uh, I, I did a content analysis on the qualitative results of the um, pilot study. And I actually asked people, um, what do you think about the, the materials? Do they give you enough information to make a trustworthiness rating? Um, so does that little study vignette, does that give you enough information? Is it realistic enough for you? And most people said no. Most people said they needed more information. So um, we, I knocked up this little thing here. I simulated some, some more data which looked nicer in a plot. And I threw this into LaTeX and basically typeset it so that it looks like a mini study to make it a little bit more realistic and to give people a bit of a sense of a little bit more of the detail of the study. So that was one thing that was different. 
And another thing was that in the, you might recall in the first study, in the pilot, the manipulation information was quite, is relatively subtle, right? It's just a little bit of text within the main text of the, um, of that material and it doesn't really stick out too much. So we thought, well, it's possible that people actually missed that manipulation. So in the full study, we actually added this text profile, we, we call it a profile, to for people to read before they actually saw this. So we wanted to make sure that that prime was fairly strong, fairly salient. And the highlighted bit is what we were um, focusing on uh, as our primary measure. Um, this particular text is what someone would have seen were they in the pre-registration condition. So if we go all the way back here to my um, the methodology, this is what someone in the pre-registration um, or middle condition would have seen before they saw the study vignette. Um, so like I said, you know, we basically explained um, that the, the, the fictional study had been pre-registered. We didn't use the words pre-registration or registered reports at all. We felt that they would be a bit too loaded and that people would, you know, extremely uh, quickly see the, the idea of what we were doing. So we wanted to make it a little subtler than that. And so uh, over to the findings for the full study. Again, we asked the same questions and uh, we got their opinions on the incentives, which is, um, well, I'll go into that in a moment. I will leave that for now. So this is uh, the kicker. Uh, that effect that we saw in the pilot study with these you know, nice little linear expected uh, relationship between trust and pre-registration status, that completely disappeared for the full study, which is a little bit um, frustrating and upsetting uh, because we kind of don't know what's going on now. <laughs> is trustworthiness indeed increased for a registered report finding or a pre-registered finding. So if you look at the plot on the left, plot A, this was the data plot for the full data set. We didn't make any exclusions. You can already see that there's kind of crazy stuff going on there, some really big error bars, <laughs> so much crossover, and the, the, there isn't even a trend that, that um, maps on nicely to the pilot findings. At this juncture, I'll just briefly mention the exclusion. So like I said, the full study was a registered report itself. And in the stage one, before we got in principle acceptance, reviewers in stage one suggested we should do a manipulation check, basically, to make sure that people were being primed in the way that we wanted to, um, which makes sense. So we basically asked people after they had answered all the questions and whatnot, we asked them about whether they had noticed the prime, you know, was the fictional study that you just saw a, a pre-registration or was it a registered report? So we explicitly asked them if we noticed that, that manipulation. We ended up excluding two thirds of the data based on this manipulation check, which is pretty crazy. So going to plot B, um, which is post-exclusion data plot. It's even crazier than the first one. The error bars are even bigger if that's possible. And um, there's, there's basically not much going on at all that makes a lot of sense. Now, like I said, um, we had to exclude two thirds of the data based on the exclusion criteria, which ended up being a, a total sample of 200, right? So if you're splitting up 200 people, into six conditions, that's not many participants per condition. So it it's logical that there's a lot of noise in the plot, but it's also the case that we made those exclusions in an attempt to cut out some noise, right? That's kind of often what, what these things are made to do. And it's a little disconcerting that, that given that uh, the plot is as crazy and messy as of what it is. Note also on the left on the, um, the Y axis for plot B, the range for the dependent variable of trust, again, that's a one to nine Likert scale, that's extremely wide. So it's just all sorts of crazy, all sorts of crazy. It sadly makes me, uh, makes me think a little bit of this cartoon here. The error bars weren't quite uh, greater than eight standard deviations, but you know, they were pretty big and a little bit upsetting. 
why is it upsetting? Now I'm someone who's a, a very firm open science advocate. I love open science, I love slow science and I love celebrating error in science. However, I really firmly believed that people would think, yes, pre-registration registered reports, that is so much more trustworthy. I really believed that that what would be seeing in real life would be what we saw in the pilot, that decent, strong, linear effect, right? That strong relationship between trustworthiness, perceived trustworthiness and, and registration. So that's why I was upset, because I really believe that pre-registration registered reports should be enhancing people's perceptions of trust in the in the findings. Um, so that's the plots. And if we look at the inclusion base factor, now compare this inclusion base factor to the one of the pilot, which was 1400 odd. This is a base factor of somewhere between zero and one. So we, in, uh, we calculated an inclusion base factor in favor of the alternative hypothesis, which means that if you invert that 0.359 number, you actually get some weak pro-null evidence. And again, that inclusion base factor basically lets us separate out that main effect of pre-registration right from the rest of the model. So there is basically no point in including pre-registration as a term in this model. It does nothing to explain variance kind of. That's 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 what we're looking for. It's, it's a very uh, there's there's nothing going on with trust and pre-registration. Which is why the qualitative um, the qualitative uh, questions or, or um, results were interesting. So we basically asked people, what do you think about these, these um, initiatives? What do you think about them? One in five people said that they were neutral about them. About one in 10 people said they're good, but not practically useful. Um, half of people said that they're good, very useful. Half of people are on, on my sort of thinking. And a couple of people even went so far as to say that they don't think they're a good initiative at all. And again, one in five people said something else. It's complicated, basically. That's what it boils down to. So people wrote a lot of different things. And like I said, I did a content analysis on these, on these different comments because we had a lot of data. And it was good to sort of see what sort of themes would come out. What were people saying the most? What were people people's main concerns about register, registered reports and pre-registration? So a lot of people mentioned hindering, um, uh, hindering creativity or exploration in the scientific process. And some people mentioned that it slows science down. Other people in this session have already mentioned those, and I won't mention them again, um, but they are very common problems people have with pre-registration or registered reports. So people also said um, pre-registration and registered reports are not a panacea. For one thing, they don't fix QRP and fraud. Well, you know you're right, they don't. And there's not a system that we could possibly have in place that would fix QRP and fraud because I firmly believe that if someone is going to be systematically and premeditatively committing QRP and fraud, so if they're deliberately doing the wrong thing, they are doing bad faith science and they're gonna keep doing that. We, we can't change that. What it does fix is that it helps good faith scientists do better science, right? It helps people um, plan out their stuff. It helps them avoid bias. This is again for people who really wanna do the right thing and that will help. I, I firmly believe that. People said, no, it doesn't fix the file draw problem. Well, you're right, it doesn't. But I think that it can help avoid a big file draw problem in that it can give people an opportunity or a, a place to put stuff that, that didn't quite work, right? You've got a pre-registration document that you've already uploaded to the OSF. You run the study. It doesn't, didn't work the way you wanted it to. That's a bummer. What you can do is just put your data up, put your materials up, put your code book up online, and someone else can come and pick up where you left off if you don't have the time to chase up the failed study, right? So no, it doesn't fix the file draw problem, but it gives people an incentive to just, you know, not just stuff their results away, at least they can put something up for their work, right? People are also having issues saying that, uh, you know, it might replace critical thinking in science. I don't think that's true at all. Um, but, but that is a concern that a lot of people raised. Um, and I think that 
um, so just sort of just to, to finish my main thought here, um, we still don't know if people see pre-registration or registered report findings as being more trustworthy. I think it's complicated. I think trust in science is, is a tricky thing, especially now. And I think what both George and Marcel mentioned is that we're in the infancy stage of psychological, a reform in psychological science and in other sciences. This is early days. We're, we're still ironing out the creases. And I think that that's a really positive sort of thing to think about. We can work on increasing trust, right? We can work on this stuff. And I think the work that Olmo, um, for example, and George have been doing, taking a look at things like specificity and adherence to, to pre-registration plans, um, some of the participants who, who responded in the qualitative um, uh, aspect of the, the results in my study, they mentioned these things. They said, well, if people don't adhere to their pre-registration, they're useless. They said, if people don't um, you know, include enough detail in their pre-registration, it's not gonna be helpful and they're right. So I think it's about finding out these little creases so that we can increase trust. And so that it's not just perceptions of trust, but that it's actual, that science is becoming more trustworthy. So that's, that's my hope. And with that positive note, uh, I'll end my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Saran, uh, for the nice and transparent uh, talk. Um, Saran actually uh, wrote a blog post about this, her experiences with uh, doing this study as well, which I highly recommend. I think you can find it somewhere on, on Twitter. It's in um, also Bayesian Spectacles, EJ Wach and Marcus blog. That's yes, highly recommend it. Um, Marcel had a question. Um, he was wondering whether the variance of trust was higher among those who are familiar with uh, pre registrations. So I think that was based on, uh, on slide 10, where the mm. error bars, I think, were a little bit higher for mm. those who are familiar with pre registrations. So I guess he was wondering whether that's actually the case. Well, let me just share my screen again. So I, I have a, I'm going to have to disappoint you here. This is not familiarity with pre-registration. This is familiarity with the fictional author of the study. So I'll show you. So you can see here on this slide here, a researcher with whom you have never collaborated. This, is, um, this refers to um, the fact that sometimes people judge studies differently when they come from people they know, um, right? That's, that's a, a fairly uh, common thing to expect. And we wanted to account for that, I guess, in, in, our, in our study. We wanted to see if, you know, familiarity, because people, uh, we anticipated that people might have issues with the protocols to some degree, but that if they knew and trusted the person that, that published those pre-registered findings or those register report, um, that they might actually um, be more trustworthy or, or trust the study more. So you can see that, pilot study is a little neater to show you. Um, so when they were um, manipulated with a familiar author, so when the author of this fake little study was familiar to them, um, they were more likely to trust the findings overall. So that's not exactly, and may, look, maybe I should have mentioned familiarity to prevent confusion. I just thought that I could gloss over it and that no one had mentioned it because it, it just added time to my talk that and it seemed to be outside of the scope, <laughs> but I'm sorry about that. I think it's clear now. Um, so Daniel Larkins has a question as well. So he was wondering, okay, um, of course you have uh, pre-registration, trust in pre-registration as an ideal, right? An ideal, an ideal world of pre-registration happens. Uh, but there's also pre-registration as is currently practiced. Um, mm, mm. Do you think that respondents would uh, differentiate uh, between these two? What do you think that the respondents had in mind? Well, quite possibly. So that's actually something that I discuss in the in the paper itself. I think so. There was a big, big, big time gap. I mean, like a year and a half to two years between the collection of the first data and the collection of the data for the full study. The collection of the data in the pilot study, I think, was done in about 2016, and 2019 was the full study. So I think in that, basically in the in the time between those two time points, 
people have become maybe potentially more aware of the issues with pre-registration of registered reports, more pre-registration than anything actually. Um, I think people have started to sort of explore pre-registration for themselves in that time. Um, and it's quite possible that, that people are, are starting to realize, yeah, there are issues with pre-registration that need to be ironed out. So I think it's quite possible that what we had in our minds was the ideal. I, I was certainly very idealistic about them uh, when I first started this study, again, in 2015 or so. I, I didn't realize myself about all these complications that pre-registration is, is difficult to do right. And it's, it's as a system, it's hard to get going and, and be consistent across, you know, across people, across disciplines and whatnot. There, there are complications. And I think it's quite possible, especially again in the later data collection point that people were starting to touch on that and say, hey, I like the idea, but it's complicated. <laughs> I think that's, that's completely possible, yeah. That's a, that's a good observation, yeah. Yes, thank you. Uh, that uh, nicely links to uh, my final remarks. Uh, so thanks, Sarah Ann. Um, I'll share my screen once more. So let's see. Yeah, so if there's one thing I think our, uh, our talks have, uh, have shown is that uh, pre-registration is indeed not a panacea. And there's uh, still a lot of things that are going wrong, uh, also because pre-registration is still in its infancy. So to answer the question, how is pre-registration? Does it actually allow others to transparently evaluate the severity of the test? Um, well, we're not sure. So we, can, we have some conclusions. Uh, so first, the quality of pre-registered hypotheses is low. Um, selective hypothesis reporting is prevalent. Also, important study elements are not adequately described, neither in the pre-registration and in the paper, which makes it really hard to uh, assess pre-registration effectiveness. Um, pre-registration does seem to have the expected effects on a proportion of positive results. So that decreases for pre-registered studies compared to uh, standard studies, and is still higher uh, than in registered reports. So that's actually the, um, the proportion that you would expect beforehand. Uh, it is also unclear whether participation uh, increases trust in science, as Sarah Ann uh, outlined. So all in all, I guess it's a mixed bag. Uh, I would say a little bit of a sad result. So we're definitely not there yet. Um, but I also think there's a lot of room for improvement. So, um, yeah. for example, registered reports could resolve the problem with standard pre-registrations because reviewers can then flag unspecific or non-producible uh, pre-registrations. Uh, I think the registration infrastructure can be improved. I think the uh, Center for Open Science is taking huge steps in that. And uh, there's more and more templates for pre-registration. Also, skills can be improved. So this, this will be a matter of education, I guess, for uh, also for us as meta scientists to, to handle this. Um, so in general, uh, all of this leads to more work for meta scientists, which I guess is a good thing. Uh, if only the funding bodies would uh, actually fund uh, our work, that would be really nice. Um, so with that, I'd like to uh, conclude this session. I'd like to thank all the speakers and, and all those who uh, uh, were here, even on a Saturday morning European time. Uh, so yeah, it's 9 p.m. now in Amsterdam. Um, so I think I'll just grab a beer and go hang out with my friends. Uh, any case, uh, thanks everybody for uh, being here. Uh, I think it was a really nice, uh, nice session. Thanks, Thank Omar. Thanks, Omar, for, for organizing. Thanks. Nice work, Omar. <laughs>